Imagine a universe where every thought, word, and deed is like a seed planted in the garden of existence. The fruits of these seeds, be they sweet or bitter, define our present and shape our future. The Buddha's timeless wisdom reveals that we are neither prisoners of our past nor puppets of destiny. Instead, we hold the power to transform our lives no matter how entangled we may seem. Today, let us delve into the profound teachings of Kama, a doctrine that explains the mysteries of suffering, the hope of redemption, and the boundless potential within each of us to rewrite our fate. Nature of Kama As you sow the seed, so shall you reap the fruit. Samyutta Nikaya Is one bound to reap all that one has sown in just proportion? Not necessarily. In the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha states, If anyone says that a man must reap according to his deeds, in that case, there is no religious life, nor is an opportunity afforded for the entire extinction of sorrow. But if anyone says that what a man reaps accords with his deeds, in that case, there is a religious life and an opportunity is afforded for the entire extinction of sorrow. In Buddhism, therefore, there is every possibility to mold one's kamma. Although it is stated in the Dhammapada that not in the sky, nor in mid-ocean, nor entering a mountain cave is there found that place on earth where abiding, one may escape from the consequence of an evil deed yet one is not bound to pay all the arrears of past kama. If such were the case, emancipation would be an impossibility. Eternal suffering would be the unfortunate result. One is neither the master nor the servant of this kama. Even the most vicious person can, by his own effort, become the most virtuous person. We are always becoming something, and that something depends on our own actions. We may at any moment change for the better, or for the worse. Even the most wicked person should not be discouraged or despised on account of his evil nature. He should be pitied, for those who censure him may also have been in the same position at a certain stage. As they have changed for the better, he may also change, perhaps sooner than they. Who knows what good karma he has in store for him? Who knows his potential goodness? Anguli Mala a highway robber and the murderer of more than a thousand of his brethren became an arahant and erased, so to speak, all his past misdeeds. Alavaka, the fierce demon who feasted on the flesh of human beings, gave up his carnivorous habits and attained the first stage of sainthood. Ambapali, a courtesan, purified her character and attained arahantship. Ahsoka, who was stigmatized as Kanda, wicked, owing to his ruthlessness in expanding his empire, became Dharmasoka, or Ahsoka the Righteous, and changed his career to such an extent that today, amidst the tens of thousands of names of monarchs that crowd the columns of history, their majesties and graciousnesses, serenities, royal highnesses, and the like, the name of Ahsoka shines and shines almost alone, a star. These are few striking examples which serve to show how a complete reformation of character can be affected by sheer determination. It may so happen that in some cases, a lesser evil may produce its due effect, while the effect of a greater evil may be minimized. The Buddha says, Here, O bhikkhus, a certain person is not disciplined in body, in morality, in mind, in wisdom, has little good and less virtue, and lives painfully in consequence of trifling misdeeds. Even a trivial act committed by such a person will lead him to a state of misery. Here, O bhikkhus, a certain person is disciplined in body, in morality, in mind, in wisdom, does much good, is high-souled, and lives with boundless compassion towards all. A similar evil committed by such a person ripens in this life itself and not even a small effect manifests itself after death, not to say of a great one. It is as if a man were to put a lump of salt into a small cup of water. 
What do you think, Obikus? Would now the small amount of water in this cup become saltish and undrinkable? Yes, Lord. And why? Because, Lord, there was very little water in the cup, and so it became saltish and undrinkable by this lump of salt. Suppose a man were to put a lump of salt into the river Ganges. What think you, O Bicchus? Would now the river Ganges become saltish and undrinkable by the lump of salt? Nay, indeed, Lord. And why not? Because, Lord, the mass of water in the river Ganges is great, and so it would not become saltish and undrinkable. In exactly the same way, we may have the case of a person who does some slight evil deed which brings him to a state of misery. Or, again, we may have the case of another person who does the same trivial misdeed, yet he expiates it in his present life. Not even a small effect manifests itself after death, not to say of a great one. We may have the case of a person who is cast into prison for the theft of a halfpenny, penny, or for a hundred pence, or, again, we may have the case of a person who is not cast into prison for a halfpenny, for a penny, for a hundred pence. Who is cast into prison for a halfpenny, for a penny, or for a hun, dread pence? Whenever anyone is poor, needy, and indigent, he is cast into prison for a halfpenny, for a penny, or for a hundred pence. Who is not cast into prison for a halfpenny, or for a penny, or for a hundred pence? Whenever anyone is rich, wealthy, and affluent, he is not cast into prison for a halfpenny, for a penny, for a hundred pence. In exactly the same way we may have the case of a person who does some slight evil deed which brings him to a state of misery, or again, we may have the case of another person who does the same trivial misdeed and expiates it in the present life. Not even a small effect manifests itself after death, not to say of a great one. Cause of adverse result, good begets good, but any subsequent regrets on the part of the doer in respect of the good done deprive him of the due desirable results. The following case may be cited in illustration. On one occasion, King Pasanadi of Kosala approached the Buddha and said, Lord, here in Savati, a millionaire householder has died. He has left no son behind him. And now I come here after having conveyed his property to the palace. Lord, a hundred lakhs in gold, to say nothing of the silver. But this millionaire householder used to eat broken scraps of food and sour gruel. And how did he clothe himself? For dress he wore a robe of coarse hemp, and as to his coach, he drove in a broken-down cart rigged up with a leaf awning. Thereupon the Buddha said, Even so, O king, even so. In a former life, O king, this millionaire householder gave alms of food to a Pacheka Buddha called Tagarasiki. Later, he repented of having given the food, saying within himself, it would be better if my servants and workmen ate the food I gave for alms. And besides this, he deprived his brother's only son of his life for the sake of his property. And because this millionaire householder gave alms of food to the Pacheka Buddha Tagarasiki in requital for this deed, he was reborn seven times in heavenly blissful states. And by the residual result of that same action, he became seven times a millionaire in this very Savati. And because this millionaire householder repented of having given alms, saying to himself, it would be better if my servants and workmen ate the food. Therefore, as a requital for this deed, he had no appreciation of good food, no appreciation of fine dresses, no appreciation of an elegant vehicle, no appreciation of the enjoyments of the five senses. And because this millionaire householder slew the only son of his brother for the sake of his property, as requital for this deed, he had to suffer many years, many hundreds of years, many thousands of years, many hundreds of thousands of years of pain in states of misery. And by the residual of that same action, he is without a son for the seventh time, and in consequence of this, had to leave his property to the royal treasury. 
This millionaire obtained his vast fortune as a result of the good act done in a past birth. But since he repented of his good deed, he could not fully enjoy the benefit of the riches which Kama provided him. Beneficent and Maleficent Forces In the working of Kama, it should be understood that there are beneficent and maleficent forces to counteract and support this self-operating law. Birth, Gati, Time or Conditions, Kala, Personality or Appearance, Upadi, and Effort, Payoga, are such aids and hindrances to the fruition of Kama. If, for instance, a person is born in a noble family, or in a state of happiness, his fortunate birth will sometimes hinder the fruition of his evil kama. If, on the other hand, he is born in a state of misery or in an unfortunate family, his unfavorable birth will provide an easy opportunity for his evil kama to operate. This is technically known as gati sampati, favorable birth, and gati vipati, unfavorable birth. An unintelligent person who, by some good comma, is born in a royal family, will, on account of his noble parentage, be honored by the people. If the same person were to have a less fortunate birth, he would not be similarly treated. King Dutagaimani of Ceylon, for instance, acquired evil comma by waging war with the Tamils and good comma by his various religious and social deeds. Owing to his good reproductive kama, he was born in a heavenly blissful state. Tradition says that he will have his last birth in the time of the future Buddha Meteya. His evil kama cannot, therefore, successfully operate owing to his favorable birth. To cite another example, King Ajatasattu, who committed parricide, became distinguished for his piety and devotion later owing to his association with the Buddha. He now suffers in a woeful state as a result of his heinous crime. His unfavorable birth would not therefore permit him to enjoy the benefits of his good deeds. Beauty, Upadi Sampati, and ugliness, Upadi Vipati, are two other factors that hinder and favor the working of Kama. If by some good Kama, a person obtains a happy birth but unfortunately is deformed, he will not be able fully to enjoy the beneficial results of his good karma. Even a legitimate heir to the throne may not perhaps be raised to that exalted position if he happens to be physically deformed. Beauty, on the other hand, will be an asset to the possessor. A good-looking son of a poor parent may attract the attention of others and may be able to distinguish himself through their influence. Favorable time or occasion an unfavorable time or occasion, Kala Sampati and Kala Vipati, are two other factors that affect the working of Kama. The one aids and the other impedes the working of Kama. In the case of a famine, all without exception will be compelled to suffer the same fate. Here the unfavorable conditions open up possibilities for evil, Kama, to operate. The favorable conditions, on the other hand, will prevent the operation of evil kama. Of these beneficent and maleficent forces, the most important is effort, payoga. In the working of kama effort or lack of effort plays a great part. By present effort, one can create fresh kama, new surroundings, new environment, and even a new world. Though placed in the most favorable circumstances and provided with all facilities, if one makes no strenuous effort, one not only misses golden opportunities, but may also ruin oneself. Personal effort is essential for both worldly and spiritual progress. If a person makes no effort to cure himself of a disease, or to save himself from his difficulties, or to strive with diligence for his progress, his evil comma will find a suitable opportunity to produce its due effects. If, on the contrary, he endeavors on his part to surmount his difficulties, to better his circumstances, to make the best use of the rare opportunities, to strive strenuously for his real progress, his good comma will come to his succor. When shipwrecked in deep sea, the Bodhisattva Mahajanaka made a great effort to save himself, 
while the others prayed to the gods and left their fate in their hands. The result was that the Bodhisattva escaped while the others were drowned. These two important factors are technically known as Payoga Sampati and Payoga Vipati, Though we are neither absolutely the servants nor the masters of our kama, it is evident from these counteractive and supportive factors that the fruition of kama is influenced to some extent by external circumstances, surroundings, personality, individual striving, and the like. It is this doctrine of kama that gives consolation, hope, reliance, and moral courage to a Buddhist. When the unexpected happens, difficulties, failures, and misfortunes confront him, the Buddhist realizes that he is reaping what he has sown and is wiping off a past debt. Instead of resigning himself and leaving everything to Kama, he makes a strenuous effort to pull out the weeds and sow useful seeds in their place, for the future is in his hands. He who believes in Kama does not condemn even the most corrupt because they have a chance to reform themselves at any moment. Though bound to suffer in woeful states, they have the hope of attaining eternal peace. By their deeds, they create their own hells, and by their own deeds they can also create their own heavens. A Buddhist who is fully convinced of the law of Kama does not pray to another to be saved, but confidently relies on himself for his emancipation. Instead of making any self-surrender or propitiating any supernatural agency, he relies on his own willpower and work incessantly for the weal and happiness of all. This belief in Kama validates his effort and kindles his enthusiasm because it teaches individual responsibility. To an ordinary Buddhist, Kama serves as a deterrent, while to an intellectual, it serves as an incentive to do good. This law of Kama explains the problem of suffering, the mystery of the so-called fate and predestination of some religions, and above all, the inequality of mankind. We are the architects of our own fate. We are our own creators. We are our own destroyers. We build our own heavens. We build our own hells. What we think, speak, and do becomes our own. It is these thoughts, words, and deeds that assume the name of Kama and pass from life to life, exalting and degrading us in the course of our wanderings in samsara. Says the Buddha, man's merits and the sins he here hath wrought. That is the thing he owns, that takes he hence, that dogs his steps like shadows in pursuit. Hence let him make good store for life elsewhere. Sure platform in some other future world, rewards of virtue on good beings wait. The doctrine of Kama offers profound solace and boundless hope. It reminds us that while our past actions may cast shadows, the present moment shines as a beacon of opportunity. Through effort and mindfulness, we can sow seeds of virtue that blossom into peace and liberation. The examples of Angulimala, Alavaka, and Ambapali illuminate a profound truth. Transformation is always within reach, and no soul is beyond redemption. Let us reflect on the Buddha's wisdom. We are the architects of our own fate. By our deeds, we create both our heavens and our hells. This teaching empowers us to rise above despair, to let go of judgment toward ourselves and others, and to cultivate compassion, resilience, and determination. As the currents of Kama flow, we must navigate them with intention and grace, for in every moment lies the power to shape a brighter path. The question remains, what seeds will you sow today? The answer, dear friends, is yours to cultivate. If you found value in this discussion and want to continue exploring the depth and wisdom of Buddhism, don't forget to like this video. Subscribe to Cultivating Buddhism and share your thoughts in the comments. May the teachings of the Buddha bring you peace and guide you on your path to enlightenment.